Let's take a look at the history of navigation. Navigation sort of started out initially with just observation, just kind of looking at you know what's around us and try to mapping from there. Uh, so you drive toward a mountain or a building close to wherever it is that you're trying to go. Um, the setting sun also indicates a westerly direction. So navigation earliest on was used. Um, uh, the sun was was used earliest on. And, um, and then we kind of got into maps where they plotted objects on paper to kind of represent their surface um, as you might see it from above, although um, early on they weren't able to see things from above. And then were some imaginary lines that were added to these maps. A lot of land <laughs> and then there were some imaginary lines added to these maps of latitude and longitude. So this is where you might want to start adding um, to your notes. The previous stuff was probably uh, some background information you already had, had known. Um, but go ahead and add this into your engineering notebook, uh, latitude and longitude. And latitude runs east-west and measures north-south um, distances. The lines run east to west. And longitude lines run north and south and measure east to west distances. So here's an example of lines of latitude. They're running east-west, but they measure north-south distances. And then longitude lines. Then uh, we get into the compass, and that is just a magnetized piece of iron to align to a magnetic field. It always points to the magnetic north, which is not necessarily uh, the same as true north. It's not the same as true north, uh, but it's slightly off um, in one direction. So you can see because of the tilt of the Earth here, uh, magnetic north is um, off by a few degrees. Um, but they still use it for navigation, and it worked um, very effectively, and people still use it today. For ocean passaging, yar, they use something called dead reckoning, and dead reckoning uses time and velocity. And so the sextant will measure angular altitude of stars above the horizon, and then a walker log was dragged behind the boat to indicate the speed. So if you, and here's an example, a little picture of a sextant. If you knew how far, how fast you were moving, and you knew how um, like your exact position at that moment, then you can sort of predict where you will be you know tomorrow at this time and the next day um, if you're going that same velocity and so that's how they would sort of predict um, where they were going to go that's also how they would map out um, where they believed that they were from their starting point they would sort of map you know the current um, location as best they could from the stars so they could see if they deviated from their path they knew how fast they were going so it gave them a, a pretty accurate idea as to where they were even if they were in the middle of the ocean now we get into using chains of towers. So early pilots navigated by sight. Uh, they would set up routes based off a chain of visual towers. So you can see here you have a bunch of towers. So they're just kind of uh, following from tower to tower. And that kind of got them where they wanted to go. You had to have line of sight to get from tower to tower. So if there were clouds or dust or storms or something like that, then it was really difficult. And so early piloting was um, a rather dangerous endeavor. Then we get into actual radio navigation. So this is a lot more of our recent history. I'm going to have you take a look at um, each one of these in a little bit more detail. Um, so you don't necessarily need to write all these down yet. Just wait until the page comes up. But first, there's DME, or distance measuring equipment, then long range navigation, instrument landing systems, very high frequency omnidirectional range non-directional beacons, and then global positioning systems. So most people um, at this point have heard of GPS because it's in most of our phones even. Um, but some of these other ones you probably have not yet heard of. So let's take a look at DME. DME um, measures slant range distance. So a DME station, and typically they're combined with a VOR station, which we'll talk about later, um, will give you the distance. And what it does is it sends a VHF or a UHF radio signal and then it times the propagation delay as it uh, bounces back and forth. So um, this gives you an actual distance in nautical miles to the station. So as you can see here, um, when you're really far away, it's pretty accurate distance-wise. Um, even if look, you can see the height here, we're 1.2 nautical miles above the ground, 7,000 feet. Um, the actual ground distance is only 19.9 miles, but the slant height is what it it reads out to you. That's 20 nautical miles. Now when you're right over the top of it, then it's still going to read 1.2 because that's your actual altitude. When you are, um, you can see here it's 4.8 nautical miles away, that diagonal then you know gets a little bit more accurate to your ground distance. So a pilot would need to know that it's actual slant height um, or hypotenuse of the distance away from that VOR. 
Loran, um, or Loran C, which is kind of what was used most recently, was long range navigation. It was designed for maritime navigation and um, it was also more for the military because it was really expensive um, and it was, but it was accurate for long distances and um, it was, again, it was accurate, which was different than, you know, previous navigational tools that they had used. So that made it really useful, which is why the military um, decided to use it. But with the advent of GPS, it's really not used so much anymore, really as of about 2010. Um, so it's just a supplement to aerial navigation. ILS is instrument landing systems. These are navigational aids to guide aircraft on runway. These are super cool because it helps pilots know do they need to um, move to the right or to the left? Do they need to go up or down so they have a good um, attack to hit the runway? And so you're going to learn a little bit more about this in the next um, presentation. And as well you will on VOR, very high frequency omnidirectional range. This is a VOR um, indicator inside an airplane and you're going to learn a lot more about how to navigate using VOR in the next presentation. When you do your flight simulators you're going to have to fly from point to point using only VOR navigation. So you're going to get pretty good at it. Uh, this shows the aircraft's position relative to the VOR radial and we'll get into that a little bit more um, in a bit. So the non-directional beacon measures the clockwise angle as we're going around the circle here. Um, between longitude direction and the non-directional beacon of the airplane. So this is the oldest electronic navigation um, and that's still currently being used. And um, it can be used at a lower altitude than VOR. So as you're flying at really low altitudes, it's, it still works. Uh, it does not have a direction, again, like the instrument landing system where your landing gives you specific directions on where you need to go. Uh, this does not have that. But again, it follows the curvature of the Earth, so it can be received at a much greater distance. So finally, let's take a look at GPS, the Global Positioning System. This is a U.S. space-based radio navigation system, and it gives three-dimensional location, the latitude, longitude, and altitude, um, and a timestamp of that particular position. And so the components um, to make this thing work are you have to have multiple satellites orbiting Earth, and we'll talk about how many um, in some upcoming lessons. You have to be able to control and monitor the stations on Earth, and there has to be GPS receivers owned by the users to actually um, get that information. So more on GPS to come. And that's it for navigation. navigation.